So what's next, Professor? <laughs> uh, well, well, if you hit the next button on the slideshow, it'll tell us, and we'll see. Oh, Jen, do you want to read us off? So we're going to segue into discussing the seven hermetic principles. These come from an ancient esoteric book called the Kabbalion, which was written by the three initiates. Nobody knows who the exact author is. But these seven hermetic principles stem from ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, before it was Egypt, was called Kem, the land of black earth, where alchemy and chemistry come from. So these date back way, way when. These seven principles are believed to be the guiding principles of our living universe. So how we're going to explore these is in relationship to sexuality and gender and human beings having a spiritual experience on this plane. Everyone's just looking at me. You made the slideshow. I did make the slideshow. So let's see, what's the, what's the best format for this? Should we just like read it off and then each of us talk yeah. about it? Yeah. Maybe? Okay. I'm happy mm -hmm. to. I'm gonna, I'll, yeah. I can walk over here then or we can, we can take turns. Perfect. Yeah, okay. I, I like standing. That's good. So the first principle is the principle of mentalism. It describes that everything is mind. And what that means is that we all exist as thoughts in the mind of God. In fact, it's, a, it's very interesting, in, a, in another Hermetic text called the Hermetica, there's a, 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 an experience where Hermes or Thoth has this out-of-body experience and he meets this sort of cosmic guide. And the guide sh sh gives him a vision and shows this, this chaotic reality and then it forms by the virtue of a bright light, becomes ordered and begins to create the universe. And he explains that the holy word of God, you know, we've heard the, the word of God and the son of God and all these, these subjects in Christianity, but it, it descends back into ancient Egypt, and it's akin to how our minds give birth to speech. And so it's, it's almost like this, this as above, so below, which we'll explore in the next uh, principle as well. Within the mind of God, when, when that mind creates, it is the word of God giving birth to order within the chaotic, formless, uh, cosmic everything of reality. The underlying principle of, of this whole thing is that through thought, we create reality. It's the principle that the mind of God is always beaming. And when we as free will children of God, you know, they say God is experiencing and creating the universe through us as us. Um, whenever we are in a space of really listening to the voice of God, to the voice of truth, uh, and we take action from that space, any action that we take from that is a co-creation between God and man. It's a holy creation. And so these hermetic principles are from this ancient school of thought that's based on building the sacred kingdom, building a whole, creating this planet, making this planet a sacred planet. In the Mahabharata, uh, there's a teaching about the incarnations and the, and the life cycle of this planet and humanity as a special intermediary between the creator and the material universe. And so every thought that we think creates form on some level, and then those thoughts that we allow uh, to intentionally create form uh, with, in partnership with the, the voice of truth and the voice of the universe, the voice of God, which is unity consciousness and total loving connectedness, um, is toward the, the building and the creation of this becoming a sacred planet. Um, so the, and there is that parallel, which we're going to go over in the next principle that you mentioned, as above, so below, where when we are in that space, when our thoughts are in resonance with absolute truth, uh, when we are in partnership with the, with the mind of God, our actions um, then mirror on earth as it is in heaven. Our actions then start to create in the material world resonance um, from the heavenly celestial dimensions. Mm. Great, I love that. <laughs> um, I'm just listening because I'm in awe of them too. I, I don't think I'll go too much into detail of all the principles, but with this one, just a reminder that um, we're always creating. And so you can either be a conscious creator or an unconscious creator. And I'm sure a lot of people here have experienced that. So you are, we are responsible for the thoughts that we think, the words that we say. And it's only when you're willing to 
take responsibility for those thoughts and, and, and the things that you say, that you move from being an unconscious creator to a conscious one. Mm. It's tough. So the second principle is the principle of correspondence. So this states as above, so below, as within, so without. We can solve problems in the moment by looking at a reality from a different dimension. We use ayahuasca to grasp different planes of reality to see and heal the challenges that we face. Mm. So essentially, correspondence is just a, a, an awareness that everything is connected uh, all the time. And, then, and by perceiving the different dimensions of the connections, we can really solve a lot of things that might not make sense here physically, but it makes sense when you perceive them from a different level. And we consider the dimensions, you can, you can really look at it in a very easy, simple way by looking at the four elements. Especially as it relates to you, this makes it very personal and grounded. Show of hands, who's familiar with the four elements? Oh, good. That's the five elements. There we go. There's, there's many different planes that we can choose to look at it for. Often the way that the fifth is observed is the four completely in harmony with each other. And at the same time, the fifth is the one that creates the four. Right? So it's, it's not necessarily sometimes seen as, the, as, a, as a fifth in the separate sense. But really, like, it's almost as like the, the, the capstone of a pyramid that descends into the four sides. Right? But the, the, the traditional four elements uh, would be you know, earth, water, air, and fire, or earth, air, water, fire. You can play with the, the orders in different systems. But the essential nature of them is your physical, your emotional, your mental, and your spiritual self. And so by, by the awareness of, let's say, you know, JJ was mentioning earlier in his talk, it's like, you know that you're split, if your soul is split, if you're having like, the faces change, but the problem remains the same. If you have the same problem over and over in your life, well, physically, you're getting this, you know, different, people, the same problem sort of thing, but what is it? Well, when you start to observe that on a level of emotion, and you observe that on a level of mind, you start to see that, that those problems are stemming, the physical problems are stemming from you know, like certain belief systems and patterns or past traumas or things that are taking place within you from a, from a different frequency, something, something that's emotional, something that's invisible. But one of the, the, the core tenets, if you will, of Hermeticism actually states that all of the physical reality, everything that we see and, and touch and all of our senses here is, is a result of the invisible forces behind, behind it sort of thing. So your actions are determined by your thoughts and your feelings. And those are invisible, but in truth, they're more real than this illusion actually is. That calls back to what JJ was saying. We, we have eyes because we see. Mm. Uh, we have ears because we hear, you know. Um, and it's also really interesting with the law of correspondences. All of the great sages throughout all the different world traditions taught in parables. They would teach, like Jesus Christ would teach the parable of the sower or, or you know, all of the different uh, mythological or representative teachings where the idea is that if we can wrap our minds around a concept in a certain context, then we can echo it out. We can overlay that similar type of template into other areas of our lives. So in the, in any time we find ourselves reading myth, fable, parable, we're, we're reading and studying based on the law of correspondence. Mm. How many of you are familiar with the quote, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear? Mm -hmm. It applies one. to the same principle. So Ben and I are both students of an esoteric philosopher named Alice A. Bailey. And one of her quotes is that our entire universe is a great theater of mirrors. So when you meet these reflections of what your soul is projecting, that's looking about what's within that's causing the without. Yes. Mm. So good. Would one of you guys want to read the next one? Sure. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, are you on the third? Yeah, this is it. OK. <clears throat> oh, the whole thing from the top. Yeah. OK, so everything is constantly in motion. This is the uh, third principle of vibration. Change is a constant. At the highest rate of vibration, things appear motionless, and this is how God is described at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Even thoughts and feelings have vibrations and can be tuned to different frequencies through consciousness intent, or conscious intent, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so I actually wanna draw something for this, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna, yeah. uh, oh, I'll need a marker quickly. Well, while he's doing that, and this is part of why in meditation, we seek stillness. Uh, stillness is associated with divinity, right. with the creator, and then movement <laughs> is creation. Right. right. It's this idea of, like, let, everyone kind of comes in at their own vibration, and let's say that that vibration is here. 
But as you take the plant medicine, the medicine itself is vibrating at a higher vibration. So the, the plant medicine actually raises your vibration up to a higher frequency. But when, and what this, the, I think it was the third quote there, what it means when it says how God is described at this, at this level of things moving so fast that they appear still, is that the, the, the vibration of the infinite supreme light of oneness is moving at such a fast vibration that if we were actually to perceive it, it just seems like it's like it's like a it's like a still. You can't even really perceive it. It's moving so fast that it just is like it's like the light of the sun. You know, the light is 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 constantly moving, but to us, it's just light. It's just bright. So the whole process of of meditation and doing plant medicine and eating well and all these things is really tuning your body and tuning your your body of consciousness from this wherever vibration that you're at to the next level. And there's always another level, right? You know, it's like, if, if you're like, oh, I want to be up here and, and it feels so far, it's like, oh no. Well, just be where you're at and where is the next step for you and, and, and begin to raise. So that's what's going to be happening over the course of this week is purging out the heavy in, and, and really getting this, this tremendous shamanic you know, spiritual support to elevate yourself into the next frequency. And by the end of the week, you'll also be receiving lots of tools to help you maintain that. Because you know, you're coming here to Rhythmia and you're going oh, really up here, but it's, it is possible to drop back down if you, you know, don't carry with you the lessons that you learned along the way. And you go back home and you, you, know, you do hard drugs and you, you know, be really mean to people. Like you, your energy can drop back down, but it's really hard to because the experience of rising up so high gives you, shows you just how powerful love and light truly is and how it's all within you. So for most people is you, you go up here and then you'll kind of level out in, in about like a much higher vibration than you ever were before. So and, yeah. Okay. please, yeah, take it away. Doesn't matter. Should we rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Something that's coming up that's really relevant yeah. to, to what you're saying right now, Jordan, is the principle of attunement. It's not a separate hermetic principle. It's part of the principle of vibration. But um, when, when you have, uh, has anyone taken a sound bath or been in a sound bath before? Mm, yeah. A few people? OK. So the idea with a sound bath is that there are different uh, musical instruments that emit really pure uh, harmonic tones. And those tones pass through your body and increase the vibration and, and call all of the parts of your body into harmony. So the, so the idea is that when, when you're around something that's high vibrational, it's easier for you to be high vibrational. Um, so, so this goes into when you go home and you have the integration process, what you're eating, what you're listening to, what you're saying, the kinds of things that you're doing, the places that you go. In the tradition that I was raised in growing up, um, I, we were taught the seven hermetic principles. And in this one, what we were always told is to stand in holy places, be in sacred spaces, spend time in sacred spaces. And, and the idea was that if you would just be in holy places, and meditate there and spend time there, your own uh, radiance would increase, your own light would increase. Mm. There is, I don't know if you guys know about um, David Hawking's and his work with like levels of consciousness and how you can measure levels of consciousness. Um, but places like holy places like a church or even, um, even Grand Central Park has a really high vibration, not so much because of all the greenery and, and um, nature, but more because of the intention that was behind creating Grand Central Park. So um, a place for the city to have gr a place to go, greenery, fresh, fresh trees. So um, places that are high intentional like that really carry a strong vibration and that's a little bit part of that. But what I wanted to say earlier is this is why all of this is why they talk about people who come here with addictions like with um, even as something as small as marijuana or as heavy as heroin or drinking too much. The reason why that falls away is because that's, those are low vibrational things. And when ayahuasca enters your body and it's such a high vibration, um, you know, the higher vibration wins out. And so for a while, at least uh, I'd say, I don't want to give an exact time, everybody's different, but for, for a few months to six months, the medicine is still working on you. 
Um, and, it, and you'll still see that when you go into places that you used to go to, it just doesn't feel right anymore, and you just take yourself out of that room. And you listen don't want to, to be it. there. And listen to listen it, exactly. To it when that and if you have, like, my, my uh, big takeaway the last time that I was here was reconnecting with my inner child very heavily, like having a full conversation with my little, ch- with my little five-year-old self. And for like a year after that, the, the backdrop on my phone was a picture of me at like age five or something. And I always would like reconnect with that inner child and be like, is this where you want to be right now? Is this, is, do you feel safe? Do you feel, and if the, ever, um, if the answer was ever no, I would just take myself out of that situation. So that's one mm. thing you can start looking for after you do the uh, medicine. Yeah. And another really great anchor point is, how many of you have heard of cymatics? Mm. So cymatics is the study of the visual effects of sound on matter. So in these experiments, what they'll do is they'll take something called a tonoscope and place sand over it and then have different tones play. And there's an amazing video of a woman singing Mozart into the sand and it starts forming perfect geometry. So if you need that perfect anchor point to remember, because sometimes it's hard to envision like vibration. What, how can I vibrate into like a better mm-hmm. mood? <laughs> mm-hmm. Looking for that is a really good anchor point. So cymatics is something I encourage you to research. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so principle four, getting through it halfway, uh, is the principle of polarity. And it basically says that everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Uh, Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. All truths are but half-truths, and all paradoxes may be reconciled. So an example is, you know, it's like hard and soft big and small, love and hate. All of these things are the same thing on a different pol- polarity of the spectrum. And this actually falls very perfectly into the whole conversation uh, and the theme of LGBT and gender of really taking away the gender binary of, well, there's masculine, feminine, and that's all that there is, but saying, well, and there's a spectrum that flows between them. Does that have anything to do with like, why people say like, opposites attract? I would assume so, yeah. There is the final principle is the principle of gender. And it kind of shows how it's like that yin and yang are constantly interplaying with each other in different ways. Well, and there's also, um, this goes with polarity, gender, and also correspondence. And it's the law of physics, which is um, relativity. You know, the the concept of relativity, where everything's relative, um, every action manifest an equal and opposite reaction, you know. Principle five is the principle of rhythm, which states everything flows in and out. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. Use this principle to your advantage by being aware of the rhythm of life and polarizing yourself to the degree you desire. Rhythm is a beautiful one. It goes very well with the principle, principle of polarity in the sense that you know, all aspects of life, from cycles that you go through your day, you know, waking and sleeping, or meeting people and then falling out, or what have you, going to school or getting a job, or, or you know, w- w- all these different, everything of life has this rhythm, has this flow. And oftentimes we have this, you know, you, you see in the world these strong polarities, you know, left wing and right wing or in politics or, you know, a Christian or Buddhist or whatever, you know, all these different uh, uh, polarities and perspectives. And then you can see sort of the rhythm of the, the, the forces of, of people and how we communicate and how we act and how we think and how that changes over time as well. You know, even in, in the world, you know, like right now there's a lot of conversation about climate change and a lot of rallies and everything like that, right? And you can see that there's a strong polarity of people who are fully in support of it and fully in, in, in opposition of it. And then there's the rhythm of the conversation and how things flow as well. So the basis, the, one of the hermetic philosophies here and, and what they teach in the Kabbalion is that you can use that rhythm, being aware of it, to really polarize yourself in the direction that you want to be flowing. Because it's very easy to be lost in the rhythm of, of other people's energy, right? If, you know, if you're around a lot of uh, really passionate people or really negative people or really excited pe- uh, people, you can become polarized to that flow, to that rhythm, and you flow with them. But the thing is, is that if, if their flow is not going in a really harmonious direction or direction that you're, you're in favor to, it takes your own discipline and practice to 
really ground in and shift your own energy to be a, a, you know, polarized to where you want to be. And, uh, and, and that sometimes looks like changing your environment, changing your energy, and you've all done that by coming here. So coming here, you're polarizing yourself to a different vibration so that when you go back into the world, you have a new frequency and then others can polarize and rhythm and learn to, to, to be in rhythm with you. Does that make sense? Yes. It's like the metronomes that he showed earlier. It's kind of like mm -hmm. people can't help it when they're around you, especially if it's somebody you live with, to kind of match up to that. Maybe not as high as that frequency, but will they'll resonate with it. And they'll start to change within themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like learning how to dance with these things, mm. you know, not being in opposition with it, not just trying to completely follow it. It's like, how do I move with the thing that's moving me? How do I dance with it? How can I fo follow the choreography in a very harmonious way in my life? Yeah. Another way we can apply this principle in our lives is through routine, ritual and routine. In all of the ancient traditions all over the world, our ancestors implemented ritual. And it wasn't something that they dreamt up, it was something that they observed in nature. The rising and the setting of the sun, the lunar cycle, the astrological cycles. The idea is that nature has rhythm. And so in our own lives, when we can apply rhythm to our daily ritual and routine, that's why we often talk about a morning ritual and an evening ritual. We have solar and lunar salutations in yoga, you know. And so within these kinds of practices, we can start to see how we want to polarize ourselves. Do we want to increase our physical health? Do we want to increase our intellectual capacity? Do we want to raise our spiritual vibration? Do we want to uh, navigate relationships in new ways? The way to do that is to do a really, really healthy thing to polarize yourself, to do a really, really healthy thing and to do it in a regular, rhythmic kind of way. So that's why daily routines are epic. That's why doing something like this yearly, I think JJ mentioned we want to see you once a year. I do it twice a year, we were joking. <laughs> I'm here twice a year. The, <laughs> some of us need more help than others. So no, the, <laughs> the idea is polarizing yourself in that way. Um, you know, there's some people that have a really healthy lifestyle. They do a lot of physical work. There are people who work in construction and do a lot of physical things. And I recently met this dude who was totally built, and I'm, I made a joke about what gym he goes to. And he doesn't go to the gym. Because in his life, there's a lot of actual labor that he's doing in, in, in his craft. Um, for me, I'm a meditation teacher. My work is mostly about not moving at all. <laughs> and so I have to go to the gym, you know? So I, if I want to increase in physical strength, I have to polarize myself and give, me the, give myself those times and those moments of really going deep into that one thing, into that one direction. Uh, when we go into ayahuasca ceremony, it's not that your whole life needs to now become an ayahuasca ceremony. It's that we're polarizing ourselves into unity consciousness where all things become clear. So then we can go back into our lives and, and integrate. Mm. Beautiful. That's really good. Thank you. That was, that was, <laughs> that was epic. Yeah, epic. That was good. Great. Uh, principle six, cause and effect. Um, every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to cosmic law. Chance is but a name for cosmic law unrecognized. That's a good one. Uh, that's a good one. Thank you for that in the presentation you created. Uh, there are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. Learn to see the future by the awareness of what causes have what effects and what future causes will happen as a result. A lot of the seers and sages throughout, the tradi throughout ancient traditions, this is what they would do. They would ask, they would check you out. They would see what you've already got going on in your life in order to predict the future. They would tune in to where you're at and through this particular law, sometimes we call it the law of karma. Mm -hmm. um, and, and karma also has another meaning. It means innocence. So cause and effect having an innocence to it. It just is what it is. It doesn't necessarily have a, have a um, motivation behind it. It has a cause and an effect. It is what it is. Especially in the medicine space, uh, how many of you, it's almost leading up to booking Rhythmia, had a series of synchronicities you can identify? 
where one thing led to another thing to another thing, and all of a sudden now you're here. So there's an author named Daniel Pinchbeck, who was one of the first mainstream authors to talk about the evolution of shamanism in modern culture. And in shamanic tradition, they say that synchronicities are a sign that you're on the right path. So if you start seeing 11-11 a lot, or you yes, start, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right person, right time, all of a sudden I'm in a YouTube rabbit hole and I ended up on ayahuasca. How did I get here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paying attention to the synchronicities helps pay attention to what it is that you're emitting that's causing them to come to you. And that's sort of what they call the call. Like when mm -hmm. they say Mother Ayahuasca is calling, it's kind of like that. Yeah. These like series of events that just keep leading you toward that. Mm -hmm. And then you, you just like have this feeling of like, this is meant for me. Um, and then there was something that I wanted to talk about based on cause and effect. Um, is it Nick, right? Yeah, we were talking about Wayne Dyer uh, yesterday. And um, I had the opportunity to meet Wayne Dyer uh, about three months before he died. And he was saying that he found this book, or somebody gave it to him on the beach in Maui, called Vasista's Yoga, and, which is like one of my biggest practices since he told me about it. But um, in, in the, and he said, so he says to me, like, I think I'm done. I've like transcended after, after reading this book. I don't feel like I, I feel like I'm done here. And then it was like a couple months later that I saw in the news that he had passed. And in that book, they talk a lot about cause and effect. And it's this sage, his name is the sage Vasista, and he's like in most Indian cultures, he's teaching the young prince about these things, and it's a dialogue, and that's what the book is. So a big thing about cause and effect is like what we talk about um, biblically, biblically uh, reap what you sow. So if you, mm -hmm. if you reap this, so shall you. Uh-huh, sorry. Can you write the name of that book? Yeah, 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 I'll write it up here after, because it's, it's, it is long, yeah, yeah, you're right. Business is yoga, yeah. And um, I think it's like the third longest text ever, and the summary version is pretty dense. I, I mean, I've been reading it for like two or three years now, and I only read like three or four pages a week. It's a really powerful book. But he talks about cause and effect uh, quite a bit. And then there's this thing where you start to realize uh, karma and cause and effect in, ev in everyday life. I call it karma. But, you know, there's this idea that souls make agreements before they ever come here. So when somebody does something to you that you think is good or bad, good and bad is just a construct of the mind. It's really just, um, I always say thank you to, to the universe or source or God. I say thank you because I'm, I'm now, I've gotten a little bit of my, more of my karma paid off. Like I've done it. It's okay, like this bad thing happened to me. I know I'm paying off my karma. And I want my karma to be clear. I'm trying to clear all of it. So there's just a different perception and a different way of looking at it once you kind of understand that principle. Definitely, and reconciling the paradox of it. Sometimes the synchronicities that lead us places are not always quote unquote positive. Right. You know, I, I came to ayahuasca thinking that the world was gonna end. I literally went down a 2012 rabbit hole, <laughs> thought that here we are in the midst of the Mayan apocalypse, and somehow I stumbled on ayahuasca, and I then found out someone I had went to high school with, broke her neck out of high school, was paralyzed from the neck down, told that she'd never walk again. She went down to Peru and did hundreds of experimental ayahuasca treatments with chiropractic, and she can now walk with a walker. So for me, finding wow. it through that reflection of being in emotional paralysis, thinking the world is gonna end, <laughs> sometimes the synchronicities <laughs> speak in ways that may seem incongruous to what you'd imagine spiritual awakening to be. Listen to all the gradients of that experience. And Sometimes you, the bad is not bad at all. And if you think about what, exactly, if you think about what JJ said earlier with the two compounds in ayahuasca that create new brain cells, you suddenly start seeing everything in a different, like you could have been working on this one specific problem for so long and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, of course, because now all of a sudden you have this new, these new pathways that show you something um, in a way that you've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. And this also goes into... Um, a lot of you probably heard of the law of attraction. Um, so in the principle of the law of cause and effect, the, the, it's not that we're just thinking about something and we're attracting it. It's that we're becoming the person that experiences those things and then we're becoming like the people that do experience those things. And so therefore those experiences start to manifest, you know. Um, and, and it does relate directly into synchronicity also. It's like when your mind is focused on something, when your mind is preoccupied on something, you begin to find evidence of it all over the place. You know? um, and so the, the work that we're doing on the level of the mind this week is to really create these um, healthy neural pathways, uh, these healthy ways of seeing things, the tr to eliminate illusion and to recalibrate ourselves to seeing things as they really, really, really are, you know, which I think is ultimately also the goal of meditation. 
So when we're seeing things as they really, really are, we begin to see ourselves at, in our deeper truth, and, and that deeper truth creates these new needs and these new desires and these new possibilities and gives us these new gifts and powers. And when our mind is on those new needs and those new gifts, we then start to see the effects of that. The, the thought level is the causal level, like we were talking about earlier. So the thoughts that we're having are the causes that then generate the effects. Which goes back to as, as so within, as as within, so without. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the all is mine. And mentalism. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. They all yeah. inform each They're other. They're all, yeah, exactly. They're all facets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I think we only have one principle left, which is the principle of gender. Now, this is the great bridge, too, for the rest of the, of the talk. But the principle of gender essentially says that masculine and feminine manifests in everything, on all planes and everywhere in nature, including the mental, emotional, and spiritual dimensions. So the difference is masculine is penetrative, assertive, and drives progress. And the feminine is receptive, it's sacred, it's treasured, protective, generative, and it nourishes that which is essential to life. Now, we all have masculine and feminine within us, and we must learn to balance all of them. And this is really the bridge that I mentioned, is like, we have this idea of a gender binary, or at least maybe not we in this group, but the, the large part of society and throughout, you know, throughout history, there's been this, you're you know, a man or a woman, men behave this way and dress this way and act this way, women behave this way and dress this way and act this way, and there's a line there, right? And the, the, the beautiful thing here is that that line is not so, it, it is a gradient, it is a rainbow, it is a spectrum, that we all have all of these different aspects of masculine and feminine within us. By a show of hands, how many uh, feel that the, their, your emotional body has been a little suppressed in life, kind of closed off? Mm -hmm. See, this is a very common thing for all of us because that's the way that our, the world treats us and treats the, emotion, the, the emotional state is that it's pushed down, it's suppressed, it's not important What's important is you know business and have you know have a family and then keep you know that does keep that part of your life private and everything like that. So so this is an absolutely tremendously huge uh, revelation for us that we're discussing now and and going to be taking with us uh, and opening up as we go through this week as well. So I think it's it's also important to mention that when we say masculine and feminine, we don't mean men and women. We mean masculine and feminine energy, right? So Jennifer might have a, a more masculine energy than I do, or, or vice versa. Mm. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind when we say masculine and feminine. Mm. And Jordan touched on something really, um, really crucial is that it, our days of survival now, so obviously if you think about our ancestors, it was caveman and cavewoman, and uh, he would go out and hunt and she would you know, prepare the food and all that. The, right now, the, our link to survival is the economy. And so when we think of economy, we think of strong traits, leadership and, 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 and um, assertion, like you were saying. It becomes toxic, but it's actually not really toxic from the, from the starting point. These masculine energies are pushed onto men and women. You have to have, you have to be very toxic. I mean, sorry, be, be very masculine. <laughs> very toxic, very masculine. Um, and, but you also have to be very masculine according to this paradigm that, that people have created. And it's to keep the economy going and keep everything going. And so women are neglecting that nurturing, beautiful, life-preserving side of them. And men are neglecting that as well. We had, and Preston, I only use this as an example because you mentioned it yesterday publicly in, in Breathwork that you feel like you have emotions and you, and you suppress them. And that's a very common thing now. It's not, it's not something that you're going through. It's something that most men and women all over the world are going through. And, and it's, it's this feeling of boys don't cry, be strong, you know, and it's always you're told that as a kid. And so then when these emotions come up, it's like, no, no, push them down, push them down. And that's why there's so many, so many high rates of suicide, of, of people quitting their jobs, people being angry, people lashing out or using drugs and alcohol. And it all goes back to that that toxic masculinity, which actually doesn't have to be toxic. It can be a balanced man and woman. And we were talking yesterday about, you see like the biggest gurus, whether it's Jesus or Pramahansa Yogananda, you look at photos of them, and sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a man or a woman that you're looking at. They, it's very, mm -hmm. very balanced. 
You know, they're very beautiful, but also very strong. It's kind of like stern yet loving, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's the beauty of symbolism and archetypes too. So you often see like uh, in the tarot, like the priestess with the crescent moon with the sun. So that's the merging of lunar energy, which is feminine energy, which is the dream state, which is cyclical time, creativity, imagination, and then the sun, which is the binary, the zeros and ones, masculine, masculine is the penetrative force, more logic, science, mathematics bridge together, what kind of human can you be when you can be the artist, but that can also use the architecture, mm -hmm. you know? You map mm -hmm. out the territory, but then you use your imagination to create. This has nothing to do with genitalia or gender. This right. has to do with merging the left and right hemispheres of mind to be the actuated, actual human. And if you look at like uh, the ancients, the Spartan warriors, who to this day we consider the strongest warriors in history, they were mostly vegan diets. Um, there was this new, amazing new study where they were looking at their bones. Yeah, it's, they mostly ate vegan, and they also, um, if, when you look at their coursework, aside from just fighting and training, they were taking like art classes, poetry classes. It was there was a huge emphasis on being well on being well balanced and philosophical and a strong fighter. It was all of it together. Because you don't want to also we don't want to say don't be a fighter, don't be strong, don't be all these things. That's an important thing too, but it's balancing it with with the feminine energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the relationship between the two. You know, we think about a, a garden um, with fertile soil. The, the masculine aspect would be piercing the soil and planting the seed. And then that garden remains as is. The, the garden remains the container for that nurturing, nourishing um, space to be held. And then nature has a way of responding to that. Uh, they say that when a woman's pregnant, the most important thing that she can be doing is to put her feet up, to rest. And, and just out of rest creates life. Mm. Of course, that. after the fertilization. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> except today, after what you just said, except today, it's, you know, for years, you know, when a woman, oh, she worked till her ninth month. Right. And right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But that goes back to economy and what we, we were saying. We glorify yeah. this. Wait, Unbalanced. Keep the machine moving, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is so interesting. Like in the economy, we have this um, hyper masculine uh, CEO archetype that cuts down trees, that digs in the earth, builds new buildings, and those kinds of things. And in a lot of ways, those can be, those can be done in balanced, positive ways. Uh, but there is something very interesting to pay attention to when you're taken care of. When you're in a work environment that's not hyper, hyper pressured, where there's not the fear death mentality, but you're nurtured. And in that nurturing state, new creativity blossoms up, new, new ideas, new possibilities blossom. Right. And there's even this mis mis misunderstanding. It's just on the subject of economy. I don't want to get too deep into it. But we have this idea of the economy as like a, you know, like a pie, and everyone is trying to get their piece of the pie. The economy is not a pie. It's a garden. And that by, real, and by supporting and nourishing the garden, you can grow whatever you want to and limitless resource and abundance for all if we choose to. But it's that change in perspective from, from the pie that everyone's, everyone's got their forks fighting for it or their you know, forks and their knives to a garden, which is you know, a much more feminine thing and the nourishing aspects of it and the watering of the garden. Uh, it, it, it really changes the paradigm of, of, of wealth and abundance for everybody. It shifts, it's the shift from fear to love because fear is that space of lack where I have to compete. I have to compete. This is mine. You can't have it. I'm at the top of the pyramid. If you change that to collaboration, it then becomes an ecosystem where it's not about me versus you or I got this instead of you. It's like how can we work together to grow? Because ultimately, if a result is a better world, everything should be collaboration. A Course in Miracles talks about how an insane person thinks that by that person gaining something, I'm losing something. Mm -hmm. And a sane person um, sees that by that person gaining, I can also gain. Like, we can all gain. There's mm -hmm. not like you getting a book deal is going to make me lose something. Or, you know what I mean? Like, that doesn't, that's an insane way of thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to go deeper into gender. 
uh, and the spectrum. But first, take two minutes and find a partner near you and talk about your biggest aha moment from these seven principles so far. Ready? How many minutes? Two. 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 All right, go for it. <laughs> 